welcome everyone to another episode of the music of middle earth i'm your host jordan Rennells, and i'm a teacher and musician today we get to talk about the wonderful and heroic sam wise gamji he is without a doubt one of if not the biggest hero of the story and as we'll talk about later frodo wouldn't have gotten far without sam would he we are on our way through these themes and the road is still very long ahead of us but if you're anything like me you're in it for the long journey so we break down every theme and discuss how tolkien's writing is portrayed through the music and how howard shore built these amazing and iconic pieces of music as you know if you've listened to the past episodes the next episode episode 10 is the second of our soundscapes of middle earth series i love doing these episodes and i think you'll really enjoy this next one It'll be a lot of fun, and it's been a blast putting it together for you with Sherston. Now, in the last Soundscape episode, we uh, explored the Watcher in the Water. I showed how we can create that sound and build it up to sound like they did in the movies. For the next episode, we get to have a reading from The Fall of Gondolin. Very excited about that, and I have a very special guest uh, joining us for the character dialogue as well. So I can't wait to show that to all of you. And of course, we also have more sound design to talk about. But all of that next week, for now, let's get back to Samwise the Stouthearted. We have a lot of awesome stuff to talk about today, so as always, in the words of Tom Bombadil, time to dig deep. Let's have a quick listen to today's theme, the heroic setting. We hear this theme in that fantastic scene where Sam takes to the stairs and climbs his way to save Frodo from the orcs in Return of the King. The theme just swells up behind Sam and it actually only plays through that one time in this scene. It's really short but really exciting. Lots of cool stuff to talk about with this theme and some great stuff to talk about with Sam. Sam is, of all the four hobbits on this adventure, I would say the most hobbity. He is Frodo's gardener and as it's been stated in Humphrey Carpenter's J.R.R. Tolkien, a biography, as well as a lot of other sources, Sam Gamgee is indeed a reflection of the English soldier, of the privates and batmen I knew in the 1914 war, and I recognized as so far superior to myself. So the ideas that we're looking at with this theme are going to be heroism, stout-heartedness, being proud of who you are and where you come from, all vital, vital aspects of Sam's character, knowing and fighting for the ones that you love, and of course, the simple love of stories. I want to start actually with a reading from chapter 8 of The Two Towers, The Stairs of Kirith Ungol. Don't the great tales never end? No, they never end as tales, said Frodo, but the people in them come and go when their parts ended. Our part will end later or sooner. And then we can have some rest and some sleep, said Sam. He laughed grimly. And I mean just that, Mr. Frodo. I mean plain ordinary rest and sleep and waking up to a morning's work in the garden. I'm afraid that's all I'm hoping for all the time. All the big important plans are not for my sort. Still, I wonder if we shall ever be put into songs or tales. We're in one, of course. But I mean put into words, you know, told by the fireside or read out of a great big book with red and black letters years and years afterwards. And people will say, let's hear about Frodo in the ring. And they'll say, yes, that's one of my favorite stories. Frodo was very brave, wasn't he, Dad? Yes, my boy, the famousest of the hobbits. And that's saying a lot. It's saying a lot too much, said Frodo, and he laughed, a long, clear laugh from his heart. Such a sound had not been heard in those places since Sauron came to Middle-earth. To Sam it suddenly seemed as if all the stones were listening and the tall rocks leaning over them. But Frodo did not heed them. He laughed again. Why, Sam, to hear you somehow makes me as merry as if the story was already written. But you've left out one of the chief characters. Sam Wise the stout-hearted. I want to hear more about Sam, Dad. Why didn't they put in more of his talk, Dad? That's what I like. It makes me laugh. And Frodo wouldn't have gotten far without Sam, would he, Dad? Now, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. You shouldn't make fun. I was serious. So was I, said Frodo. And so I am. We're going on a bit too fast. 
You and I, Sam, are still stuck in the worst places of the story, and it is all too likely that some will say at this point, Shut the book now, Dad. We don't want to read anymore. Maybe, said Sam. But I wouldn't be one to say that. Things done and over and made into part of the great tales are different. Why, even Gollum might be good in a tale. Better than he is to have by you, anyway. And he used to like tales himself once by his own account. I wonder if he thinks he's the hero or the villain. So, so much to unpack with this passage. I chose this to start with because really I think it sums up Sam's character in so many different ways. Let's start to go through it. The first thing that I want to point out is the simple down-to-earth lifestyle that Sam is thinking and wishing for. He's a lot like Bilbo in that way. All he wants to do is get back to his garden. He really feels this isn't something he's supposed to be involved in. He sees himself as someone who got carried along for the journey and not as the important character that he is. Frodo knows how important Sam is, though, and it just further pushes that idea of Sam's humility when he thinks Frodo is making fun of him. I think Sam is, in a lot of ways, us in the story. He's the audience, just as Bilbo plays that role in The Hobbit. In that comparison, I think it might even be best to say that Bilbo is a good representation of us, whereas Sam might be a good representation of how we might like to think of ourselves, or how we'd hope to be. He protects his master as much as possible. He fights for him. He'll do anything for Frodo, as we hear over and over through the story. That leads to the next point and the main reason why I see us, the audience, as Sam. He says, Still, I wonder if we shall ever be put into songs or tales. We're in one, of course, but I mean put into words, you know, told by the fireside or read out of a great big book with red and black letters, years and years afterwards. This whole section is just so perfectly written. Isn't this why we're all here? Let's hear about Frodo in the ring. Tolkien couldn't have known how successful his works would be, but with this passage alone, it kind of feels like he wrote it with a vision to the future, because this is what the story has and will continue to become more and more as time goes by, years and years afterwards. And I want to say that really important point again. This is why we're all here, and this is why I believe Sam is just like us. We just love the story. We don't care that we know how it'll end. We don't care that we know probably way too many details. We just want to be there for the story. I want to go to a short quote, actually, from Stephen King's book on writing, A Memoir of the Craft. King says, A thousand pages of hobbits hasn't been enough for three generations of post-World War II fantasy fans. Hence Terry Brooks, Piers Anthony, Robert Jordan, the questing rabbits of Watership Down, and half a hundred others. The writers of these books are creating the hobbits they still love and pine for. They're trying to bring Frodo and Sam back from the Grey Havens, because Tolkien is no longer around to do it for them. That is so true and so wonderfully put. I think one of the most beautiful things about Tolkien's work is that it teaches us how to enjoy the journey for the sake of the journey. There's a reason that the first chapters of the Fellowship take seemingly forever to get anything happening. I think for one, we need to know and care about these hobbits, but for another, we don't, we don't always need to be in such a big hurry. Modern life is always in a rush everywhere we go. I see these books as a perfect metaphor, especially the beginning of Fellowship and even more so the Treebeard chapter, for learning to slow down. It's okay to take your time, it's okay to enjoy the journey, to enjoy the story for the sake of the story, and not for the finish line. But I'll leave that with you. Now the last thing with this section that I want to talk about is another big one, really, and it shows something that will get us thinking about this heroic setting theme. The idea that things are not always as they seem. Sam is a simple, very hobbity hobbit. We find out later in the story, however, that he is one of the most brave, courageous, and truly heroic characters of the story. Sam says, why, even Gollum might be good in a tale. Better than he is to have by you, anyway. And he used to like tales himself once, by his own account. I wonder if he thinks he's the hero or the villain. I wonder if he thinks he's the hero or the villain. That line is something I think we all need to think about. Everything has two sides to it. Sam is the quiet hobbit gardener who just wants to be home. But he can also end up being the hero from the end of the book. I want to quickly read a small bit from that scene at Mount Doom because it's too good not to. Sam looked at him and wept in his heart. 
but no tears came to his dry, stinging eyes. I said I'd carry him if it broke my back, he muttered, and I will. So leading back to Sam's comment, I wonder if he thinks he's the hero or the villain. That sheds so much wisdom, and I think it should teach us a lot about the world that Tolkien lived through and the world of these characters and, again, the lives we live ourselves. Tolkien saw firsthand that disembodiment of evil. Both sides, if you want to call them that, were capable of doing things that were considered evil. So where do you draw the line in your head? And I think that is the perfect explanation to a few things. Number one being why you never actually see a physical Sauron. That's what evil might be for someone like Tolkien, a disembodied sense of evil. Everyone's the main character of their own story. So would you see yourself as the hero or the villain? I think we would all hope to see ourselves as the hero, but that definitely makes me think a little bit more. Now I have another reading I want to dive into uh, from the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. This is from letter 93 to Christopher Tolkien. I'm very glad that you enjoyed the next three chapters of The Ring. The third consignment should have reached you about December 10th and the last on the 14th of January. I shall be eager for more comments when you have them. Certainly Sam is the most closely drawn character, the successor to Bilbo of the first book, the genuine hobbit. Frodo is not so interesting because he has to be high-minded and has, as it were, a vocation. The book will probably end up with Sam. Frodo will naturally become too ennobled and rarefied by the achievement of the great quest and will pass west with all the great figures. But Sam will settle down to the shire and gardens and inns. C. Williams, who is reading it all, says, The great thing is that its center is not in strife and war and heroism, though they are understood and depicted, but in freedom, peace, ordinary life, and good liking. Yet he agrees that these very things require the existence of a greater world outside the Shire, lest they should grow stale by custom and turn into the humdrum. Tolkien then goes on in the letter to talk about the etymology of the word harebell, spelled H-A-R-E-B-E-L-L, and its comparison to harebell, spelled H-A-I-R-B-E-L-L, because Christopher wrote the first and amended it to the second, which is really just a brilliant kind of show of his love of and expertise of language and how he shares that with Christopher. Really beautiful. Let's talk about this letter, though. It's great to hear that right from Tolkien himself that Sam is the successor of Bilbo in that he is the genuine hobbit. Comparing Sam to Frodo in this way is really interesting. Frodo will be too distant and out of place with the world of the Shire when he returns. His quest requires this of him. His character requires this of him whereas Sam will be the one to return and enjoy the Shire and the inns and his gardens again. That goes back to what we were talking about last week, where Frodo says that some people have to give things up so that others can go on. I especially like that last section that comes from C. Williams. We talked about this in earlier episodes. For all of the freedom, peace, and ordinary living to be worth something and appreciated fully, war and strife and heroism have to play their part as well. I see Sam as being the perfect character to embody both of those sides. He's not a warrior, he's a gardener, but he becomes a true hero, and is then able to let it all go at the end. I'll end things off with the great line from the chapter, The Window in the West. Faramir says, Your land must be a realm of peace and content, and there must gardeners be in high honor. All right, and with all that, we're going to head into today's Midmark segment. <laughs> Right, in today's Midmark, I want to take a chance to do just an exploration of the orchestra so that we can continue to get acquainted with some of the different sections and instruments we might come across in these themes. We're going to do some listening to the flute family of instruments today. Uh, I won't do too much talking, I just want you to listen and enjoy these amazing instruments. Now, I'm not going to go through every possible instrument that could be considered part of the flute family. Um, but I will go over some of the main instruments that you might expect to normally hear in an orchestra setting. So let's do it. We'll start with the regular flute. Let's listen to that. Awesome. 
blossom. Now the flute has other counterparts that are of the same family of instrument that are used for different roles. A good example is the piccolo, a higher pitch instrument that can really cut through the orchestra. Let's have a listen. Really great sound there. But we can also go the other way from the flute, where we have the alto flute, a slightly lower range version. Now finally, we can go all the way down into a more kind of bass range with the bass flute. This one sounds awesome. Let's have a listen. Very cool. Such a warm sound when it's low like that. I'll play each one of these so that you can kind of get a sense of each one of them back to back. such nice sounds to them. And now finally I want to give you uh, a sense of what they all sound like together. So I wrote a short little piece of music for all of you with all of these instruments. So here we go. Enjoy. Awesome. I love that sound. We'll hear more uh, about some of those instruments when we get into this, the discussion later. But first, I have to thank our lovely patrons, Chris in Massachusetts, Bonnie in Washington, David in Iowa, and Cameron in Texas for helping make this episode happen. If you are interested in helping make the podcast happen, then head over to patreon.com forward slash music of Middle Earth. Um, there's a lot of cool things, and there's actually some new stuff over there that you can check out, so be sure to, to see what's going on there. And uh, with your help, we can aim towards longer episodes, more readings in the soundscapes of Middle Earth episodes, and hopefully when the world kind of gets back to normal, we can start to do some kind of live, we can start to do some live clinics. I would love to do that. So go check it out if you have a minute. And now, time to head back to the discussion. Right, time to dive into the theory for this theme. Let's take another listen all the way through to the heroic setting. one. So as I said earlier, we hear this clearly as Sam fights his way up the stairs to save Frodo. This theme is 
definitely a departure from a lot of the other Shire material that we've seen before. So let's start by talking about the shape of the theme and then we can get into the instrumentation. This theme really explores a really common element that is really simple but effective in making a, a piece feel heroic. It has ever-growing interval gaps. We start off reasonably small and then we grow into bigger and bigger intervals throughout the piece. Uh, to recap, if we aren't super familiar, intervals are really just a way of naming the distance between one note and another, as if we were measuring distance, but just in terms of pitch. Some notes are higher or lower than others, and we need a way to measure that, so we can write it and explain it to others. So if we're playing in G major, as this version of the theme is, we have all the notes back to back. If we number each note on the piano as we play them, G is 1, A is 2, B is 3, C is 4, D is 5, E is 6, F sharp is 7, and then G is 8 again. So we get their degree or number place in the scale. So when we name intervals, we just name them as follows. Unison, that's just the same note, a second, a third, fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, and then the octave or eight. So I'm just playing the first note and then the number that goes after it in the scale order, and that gives us our interval. So now that I'm sure that we're up to date with those interval names, let's talk about how they're used in this theme. We start off with a third, jumping from the first note to what we now know to describe as the third higher. So we start with a third. That's the first interval jump. The next one we get a little bit bigger. We jump a fifth. And then finally the biggest jump comes later in the second last bar with the interval of a sixth. Really cool. This is a great musical way of portraying that kind of growth and heroism that Sam is displaying and what's happening for his character. You can almost imagine him climbing the stairs with each interval jump getting bigger and bigger. I love that. Okay, so the next thing that I want to point out that I really think is interesting and genius of Howard Shore is the references back to the Shire and how this plays into the whole idea of this theme. If we look at the whole theme, there are seven bars of melody. There are, I would say, two main phrases and then an ending bar that is meant to lead back into the beginning bar really nicely. Let's listen to the first phrase, the first three bars. Now at the start we get those three notes. This is a more forceful, clear, or sure of itself version of those three notes that we've been hearing throughout all of the Shire material. Let's listen to all the three different intros from all the Shire material we've heard so far. Sam has chosen to become more than his hobbit self. He's using that hobbit resilience to be the hero in his own story. Now, if we move to the next phrase, the next set of three bars, we see that we again have that same reference back to the three note Shire motif. Now, what's great about this is that in the second version, it's literally the exact same as in the pensive and the rural settings and a hobbit's understanding, D, E, F sharp. I'll play all of these different versions so that you can hear the comparison with this new version. The only thing that changes is the speed at which it's played. In the other version, it's played as two sixteenth notes and then an eighth note, but in this heroic setting, it turns into two eighth notes and a quarter note. So again, a more proud and resilient side of our Hobbit. Samwise the Stouthearted is right there in the music.
the last thing that I'd like to talk about with this theme is the instrumentation. There are, as with all of the themes, varying instrumentations, but the original we hear this one on is for piccolo, flute, oboe, and violin, and with some percussion elements. I really love this collection of instruments for the heroic setting because we still have the flute and piccolo elements that give it that, that Hobbit Shire kind of feel. But we now have the earthiness of the oboe and then the emotion of the violin that adds on. These instruments blend so nicely together that we have a hard time picking each one out from the crowd. That's a nice addition though because we can slightly hear the piccolo and the flute. It isn't clear and obvious, but I don't think it needs to be or that it should be. Most of what we hear is on the violin in this theme. That's what gets the most attention. I think this again is a subtle thing, but important because we need to hear those elements of the Shire and the instruments we know them on. But having the violin take the lead role here brings out more of what I would describe as the great tales feel. So many great movie themes are played on violin and string sections that we kind of have that feeling ingrained into our ears. And even then, just keeping it into the context of these movies, by the time we hear this theme, We've already heard Rohan's themes and all the other themes that are associated with the Rohirrim. These are all primarily voiced on the string sections of the orchestra. This means a good deal of what we associate as the ancient people of kings and myth and legend has been played on the strings and the violin. So we associate this heroic setting with that same idea. I think it helps to fulfill Sam's thoughts of being in the great tales. And the last thing that I'll mention is having the piccolo there is a really awesome addition because it's got the same timbre, the same kind of sound as a flute or the whistle, but because it's higher pitched, it kind of has a sharper sound. It punches through, and I think that's a perfect translation of what Sam's going through at this moment. And so when Sam goes back to the Shire, the hobbits don't recognize the amazing things that he and the other hobbits have done. But in this moment, Going up the stairs, Sam becomes the stout-hearted, and he earns his place in the great tales. Let's take one last listen to this theme. Hope that theme sparks as much excitement for you now as it does for me. So that just about wraps it up for another episode of the Music of Middle Earth. But before we go, we of course have to check out the next theme that we're going to be looking at. Uh, not next episode, but the one after that, because we have to have the Soundscapes of Middle Earth episode. So this is the playful setting. We're going to have a great time discussing Mr. Peregrine Took, and we will definitely try to be a bit nicer to him than Gandalf is. Let's listen to that. So we will see you next time for our second Soundscapes of Middle Earth episode. I'm very excited for that. Again, if you're interested in supporting the podcast, then head over to patreon.com forward slash music of Middle Earth. And if you want to tell the world what you think about the podcast, preferably if it's good things, leave a review on iTunes or share the podcast on Facebook. Sharing on Facebook is really the best way to get the word out and to help the podcast grow. So thank you all for listening and helping me to continue to grow this project. Until next time.